If you listen to the news, read the Bible more. You know, whatever your conversations are out in the community, be in the Bible more. If you watch television, read the Bible more, okay? I had a guy text me. He said, you know, he said, I had to do a self-check. He said, I found in a day that I read the Bible three times, but I got on my phone 68 times. <laughs> I was like, whoops, right? I mean, think about it. Uh, who do you want to hear from more? right? God has said it. God spoke everything that we see into existence. When God said, let there be light, there was light. God spoke creation into existence. This is the word of God. God has given us his written word. God said it. This is the Bible. This is God's word. It's not that it merely contains God's word. It is God's word. Genesis to Revelation. Don't ignore that. God didn't call us to be editors, okay? Third thing, God said it. God gave us his living word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the living word of God. God said it. God has said it. God has spoken. And God is continuing to guide and lead and speak into our lives through his word by his spirit and, and, and through the, the way that he directs us. And that's what this morning's message is all about. Obey. How about that? You ready? Obey. <laughs> Here it comes. See, I, I, I put these messages together at the end of December, y'all. Today's message, the text and the title, were, were on a chart. You know why? Because I don't do that. Man, I, I, I do very well to, to keep up with myself. Um, but, but the young guys, they, they, they wanted to kind of be able to map it out, right? So I, so I started just sort of charting it and trying to figure out how God would lead. Now, if God says something different, then I'll preach something different. But when I got to this, I was like, Deuteronomy 11, 1 through 16. What is this? Deuteronomy means second law or the second iteration of God's word, the, 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 the covenant law that God gave his people. God spoke to Abraham way back in Genesis 12 and said, I've chosen you. You will be blessed and you will be a blessing to all nations. That's what God said to Abraham. And then as he took Abraham and his little bitty family, they made him a big family of about 70. 70 went into Egypt for about 400 years and, and became slaves essentially building uh, under the pharaohs there, the, the, the structures, the pyramid, all that kind of junk. They're making bricks. Right? They're doing this in ancient Egypt, and, and so they build all this stuff. And then God releases them, delivers them from bondage out of Egypt through the Red Sea into the wilderness. They disobeyed God. They ended up wandering around in circles for 40 years. And now we get to the point where they're about to enter the land, and God is giving them through the pen of Moses, through, through Moses speaking to them, the second iteration, the, the reminder of the covenant law that he expects of them. And that's what De Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means second law. Deuteronomy 11, 1 through 16, this is what it says. Get ready, here we go. Therefore love the Lord your God and always keep his mandate, his statutes, ordinances, and commands. Understand today that it is not your children who experienced or saw the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, strong hand, and outstretched arm, his signs, and the works he did in Egypt, the Pharaoh king of Egypt, and all his land. What he did to Egypt's army, its horses and chariots, when he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued you, and he destroyed them completely. What he did to you in the wilderness until you reach this place. And what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the Reubenite, when in the middle of the whole Israelite camp, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, their households, their tents, and every living thing with them. Your own eyes have seen every great work the Lord has done. Keep every command I am giving you today so that you may have the strength to cross, in, cross into and possess the land you are to inherit. And so that you may live long in the land the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them and their descendants. A land flowing with milk and honey. Which I found out what that means, by the way. All right, all right. For the land you are entering to possess is not like the land of Egypt 
from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated by hand as in a vegetable garden, but the land you are entering to possess is a land of mountains and valleys, watered by rain from the sky. It is a land that your God cares for. He is always watching over it from the beginning to the end of the year. If you carefully obey my commands, I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and worship him with all your heart and all your soul, I will provide rain for your land in the proper time, the autumn and spring rains. And you will harvest your grain, new wine and fresh oil. I will provide grass in your fields for your livestock. You will eat and be satisfied. Be careful that you are not enticed to turn aside, serve and bow in worship to other gods. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, that you've said it. You spoke it all into existence. You've given it as author to over 40 writers to give to us the written word <clears throat> to communicate, not merely commands and ordinances, but God, to, to reveal yourself to us, to show us who you are. And God, you've given us your living word, and I thank you so much for that song. God, we need to be lifting high the name of Jesus in everything that we do. God, let us tell people about Jesus. God, today we want to worship you. We want to celebrate you. We want to, we want to, to love you back because you loved us first. So help us to do that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Question for you. You ready? How many of y'all have one of these? Not an arm, but a watch. How many of you have one of these watches they call a smart watch? Raise your hand. Let's see. All right, so I've had several now, okay? Um, it's really funny that uh, I got one, I, I, I got one of those, one of the popular ones, you know, the, the Fitbit. Remember that? How many of you got a Fitbit? Okay. Fitbit, I found out, communicates better with Apple than it does Android, okay? And, and my phone is an Android. I'm, I'm not an Apple thing. Anyway. So, so Fitbit just never worked right for me. So I got rid of it, right? So then I decided, since I'm a, an Android kind of guy, I got me one of them Galaxy watches, right? It was huge, man. My arm's little. It's a big old watch on my arm, and, and it counts your steps, right? And you can look down, and you can throw. Oh, I've walked that far today. Do you know what? I get 10,000 steps in preaching on Sunday morning. Can you believe it? I couldn't believe it the first time it happened. Anyway, all right, so then, 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 then that was just too big a watch. It just, it was trying to answer my phone calls. I mean, it, all of a sudden my watch would ring. Hello? And it's in a drawer somewhere at the house. I needed something simpler, right? So now I have this thing. It's a Garmin something 35, whatever that is. But it's simple, right? But the app that goes with it is not. So here's what happens, y'all. And, and I know y'all are wondering, what are you talking about? I'll get to it in a minute. Just get ready. Do you know the app that is in my phone that communicates with my watch, that vibrates on my wrist and flashes things at me, tries to tell me what to do? Did y'all know that? I can be sitting on my couch, and my, this is the one that uh, aggravates me. I can be sitting on my couch, and my phone will go, my watch will go, move. Now, of course, I'm sitting on my couch, and my watch goes, move. And do you know how frustrating I get when I go, no! <laughs> right? Because I'm, I'm sitting on my recliner. I'm, in, I'm relaxed. I'm enjoying it. And then yesterday, it was real funny. So yesterday evening, it's such a pretty week. You know, the weather's great and all this sort of thing. And so Angie had gone somewhere and come back. And so yesterday afternoon, we ate dinner and everything, or right before dinner, I guess. It was sometime late afternoon. I said, well, if you want to go for a walk, we can go for a walk. And so we walked our street, right? So I'm walking down the street. And I never told Angie this before. <clears throat> but I said, all of a sudden, my, my, my watch goes, hmm. I look down, it says, move bar cleared. See, when it tells me to move, that stays there until I move. Right? So, so think about the kind of things that you're willing to obey. Do you know if I get into the app, it tells me how much I can eat? You know, you can eat this many calories in a day. 
Now, if you go exercise this month, if you'll move when the watch says move, you can eat more. That's what the app says. So if I go for a run in the morning, the app adds like, if I do six miles, for instance, the app will add anywhere from six to 700 calories. It'll allow me to eat in a day. Yay! Now, back when Fitbit was a thing, this was a funny, I don't watch a lot of the little goofy Facebook, YouTube videos. I just try to stay out of that stuff. It seems to be a distraction to me. Maybe not to you, but to me it is. And there were these, these step competitions. How many of you did a step competition where who can be the fastest to get to 10,000 steps in a day? Or who can do the most steps in a day? That kind of, Remember that? When Fitbit first came out, you know, get this, this network, this social network of friends and do as many steps as you can. Well, it was funny. I saw this video that somebody took of this lady sitting in her car. Right? She was sitting in the car and she was sitting there going. (laughs) She's trying to beat all her friends to get more steps than anybody, but she was not moving. Now, why? Who do you obey? Who do you pay attention to? Remember early in the God said it messages, I said, pay attention. Pay attention to what God's saying to us. Pay attention to what God is revealing to us. Pay attention to what it is that God is giving direction for in your life. You can't do what I do, right? I can't do what you do. What is it? Who is it that God's called you to be? What is the direction that God has given for your life? What is it that God is calling you to? What are the things that God wants you to be involved in? Not for your sake, not for my sake, not for the gathering's sake, but for the kingdom's sake. You see, for the body of Christ, for the, for the exaltation of God himself, that's what we're supposed to be about all the time. So when I was looking at this thing this morning, I, uh, not this morning, but this week as I was studying and getting back to this particular outline and everything, I was like, all right, here it comes, God. What is it that you expect of us? What do you want in my life? I remember asking him, all right, so I spent the week with my parents working around the house. I told them what I wanted to do. I wanted to clean up the place. I wanted to throw stuff away. Lots of stuff. I said to my dad, I said, what do you want to do? He said, I don't know. So my dad got on and off the tractor all week long, and I just hacked and burned and tossed and threw and right what does God expect of you have you ever asked that question I mean I, you don't have to answer me these are all rhetorical if you answer it it's like confession and, and that's not us um, much of my adult life The question I like to ask God is, God, what do you want to do today? What are we doing today, God? What what do you expect of my life today? Even more, how can I please you today, God? What can I do? See, my dad this week, we laughed together. I took some pictures. Don Thomas encouraged me. He said, if you're going to spend the week with your parents, take pictures. You'll appreciate them later. So he said, I'm like, all right, cool. So I took a picture of dad sitting on the tractor. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> right? Dad and I smiled together. We laughed together. A lot of times when I ask God, God, what what could I do today that would please you, God? Rick Warren asked it this way. What could you do to make God smile? What could you do to make God smile, right? Well, it's all right here. Do you know Deuteronomy is the, sort of the, 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 the presentation of the Shema? In Deuteronomy 6, where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. 
You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul. It's the first thing that you can do that would please God. The best thing that you could do that would please God. The thing that you could do most that would please God is to love Him and act like it. Okay? In in the text for this morning, Therefore, love the Lord your God and always keep His mandate and His statutes, ordinances, and commands. And I'll be honest with you. Man, I see a statement like that and I go, okay, here we go. You know, you got to wear the right shoes. You know, if you're going to be a pastor, you got to wear a coat and tie. You got to say the right things. You got to look the right way, right? I mean, that, that that's what I was taught as a kid. That That's what I was taught was pleasing God. Now, I'm not saying God's not pleased when you dress up. But that's not the priority. What is God looking at? He's not looking at the outside. He's looking at the inside. Is your heart's expression, God, I love you first and most and best. Is that what you're saying to God? Through your choices. Through your actions. Through your attitudes. Understand today that it is not your children who experienced or saw the discipline of the Lord your God. Now, when we see the word discipline, we think, you know, time out. Those of you my age and older, we think whipping. But anyway, time out. Right? Discipline in this context is education. It is not your children who experienced the education of who God is, of what God has done. And then he begins to list it. He says, his greatness, strong hand, outstretched arm, his signs, the works he did in Egypt to Pharaoh king of Egypt and all his lands, what he did to Egypt's army, its horses and chariots. I was reading in one commentary that for two pharaohs after the exodus, Egypt could not field an army for war. Their chariots had been destroyed. Their armies had been destroyed. He made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued you, and he destroyed them completely. What he did to you in the wilderness until you reached this place. What he did to the, to the rebellious tribes, the Reubenites, Dathan, Abiram, the sons of Eliab. The earth opened up. As, your kids didn't see that. You saw that. How about that? Your own eyes have seen every great work the Lord has done. You saw it. You've seen the evidence of God's greatness. Man, Scott, the the, the song selection this morning, just, you know, I mean, it's just perfect for this. Right? You know, we've been freed from bondage. We've been rescued. He's our rescuer. You know, the chains have fallen off. We have seen it more than that. We've experienced the release from bondage that God has given us in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The work is done and finished. God's accomplished it. It's ours to take hold of. Do we live it? Folks, I've been excited all morning. I'll be honest with you, I got here this morning, I was like, I can't wait till 8.10. And I got here at 6. I'm like, yeah. right? Man, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Except we're told you can't eat candy. You'll have to run more. See, that's what my watch would say. Don't eat that candy, you'll have to run more. No. Right? No. Man, I'm just excited about the fact that God has shown himself in our lives, in and around us. And then that last song that that Patricia sang, that that if you're troubled, if you're burdened, if if you're... Guess what? You've seen God's victory. Just know that, 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 that God has victory prepared and planned for us. Let me tell you about my Jesus. 
Right? Get excited about Jesus. Gosh, every question I hear now. What do you think about Ukraine? Well, truthfully, I don't. I mean, I pray for them. I pray for the innocents. I'll be honest with you, I'm, I don't have the capacity to understand the geopolitical context of what's going on in, in Eastern Europe. I don't. I've been there. I spent a whole summer in Poland building a church in 1985 when it was still communist bloc, right? I know there are things going over there. I'm just suspicious enough to, to believe that I don't know what they're saying is true. Just so you know, that's just me. If you don't want to listen to me, you can go now. But I put your fingers in your ears. It's okay. But, but when people ask me how I'm living today, when people ask me what's on my mind today, when people ask me why the, the, the reasons and the whys and the, the how I'm making choices today, I go, you know what? I'm trying to decide today what pleases God the most. What makes God smile? What can little old Bobby do? And we'll know this. We'll not walk, not this past Thursday, but last Thursday. Right after, you know, invasion and all that kind of stuff. I said, well, you know what I decided this morning? Whatever's happening in Ukraine, it ain't going to change who I am today. It's not going to change what I do today. It's not going to change how I talk to people today. Right? I need to know today that by choices, actions, and attitudes, that, that the course that God sets before me is going to be about pleasing Him. How can I please God most, best today? Right? Man, I just, I was, yeah. then he says, in verse 8, he says, Keep every command I am giving you today so that you may have the strength to cross into, cross into and possess the land you are to inherit. I promised this land centuries ago. Now you, this generation, and your children. That's why he says, he says, your children haven't seen what I've done, but you have, and now your children will see what I'm going to do. And he reminds us in Deuteronomy several times, he says, I'm wiping out the people in front of you, not because I just want to wipe people out, but because of their abominations, because they worship everything but me. They're out here worshiping the sun, which I hung in the sky. They're out here worshiping the rain, which I'm the one that sends it. They're worshiping everything but me. He even says, and they sacrifice their children. Baals, the Baalisms. Baal is it, it, it's not one God. It, it, it's this, this sort of nature worship thing. And folks... We've got Baalism today. The things that we will worship today should be troubling to us. <clears throat> and so that you may live long in the land the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them and their descendants a land flowing with milk and honey. All right, so after my little, you know, thing, I've always heard all my life, promised land, land flowing with milk and honey. Never really decided to go in and dig into that. And I mentioned it last week. What does that mean anyway? I mean, do you hit a rock and milk flows out? No, this is what it means. Because God sends, and this is where it was explained. It was in some of the commentaries I read for this particular, for the land you are entering to the See, a land flowing with milk and honey. Why? For the land you're entering to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated by hand as in a vegetable garden. In Egypt, because of the way the, the Nile and the overflow of the Nile once a year, they had to they had to get water in the overflow of the Nile, and they had to store it and irrigate it throughout the year. They had to work very hard to make the land in Egypt, even in the delta down in Goshen where they lived, they had to work very hard to make the land produce enough to feed the nation. The promised land's not like that. Because as the rains come off the Mediterranean and hit the mountains, it rains on the land and makes it fertile the word was verdant anybody know that word 
How many times in a week are you going to use that word, verdant? Right? And he says, this is what he says. He says, but the land you are entering to possess is a land of mountains and valleys watered by rain from the sky. It is a land the Lord your God cares for. He is always watching over it from the beginning to the end of the year. So here's what the land flowing with milk and honey means. There are going to be pastures where your cattle will flourish. And milk will be in abundance because your pastures will be flourishing. One commentator, and I, I, I didn't read this into it, but I wanted to know why there would be flowing honey. Because of the, 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 um, because the, the environment of the land, and this is what the... I had to decide whether this was a stretch or not. Um, how many of y'all, Neil Yob, is Neil up there this morning, Michael? No, okay, even Neil's out of town. Uh, Neil one time, he, he, he's he been the chairman of Deacons here quite a bit. Neil used to have beehives out back of his house. And, and he brought me some personally produced honey from his beehives. I said, that's cool. My allergist says I should eat honey from local bees well the whole context of, of a land flowing with honey was that there'd be plenty of bees flowers the, the vegetation of the land would be such that the very essence of nature would produce for them and then verse 13 if you carefully obey my commands I am giving you today. And listen, he didn't go back through and list the whole thing about, you know, whatever. He says, to love the Lord your God and worship him with all your heart and all your soul. I will provide rain for your land in the proper time. The autumn and spring rains and you will harvest your grain, new wine and fresh oil. You know what the new wine and fresh oil mean? Vineyards. Vineyards will flourish. All right, so first of all, pastures are going to flourish. Bees are going to flourish. Vineyards are going to flourish. Olive trees. Now, now, these are seasonal mentions right here. God is referring to the fact that in some seasons you're going to have this, and in some seasons you're going to have grapes. Some seasons you're going to have olives, new oils. You see, and fresh oil. I will provide grass in your fields for your livestock. You will eat and be satisfied. Be careful. You are not enticed to turn aside, serve, and bow in worship to other gods. Just because I give you oils, don't, don't start worshiping olive trees. Just because I give you new wine, don't start, start worshiping your grapevines. Don't start worshiping the rain or the seasons. Don't start worshiping the, the sun or the moon. Don't, be careful that you're not enticed to turn aside, serve, and bow and worship to other gods. One of the commentators said this about this passage. To love God is to obey God. To love God is to obey God. Years ago, I've threatened to write like three books in the course of 30 years. I've never written one. But one of them was called, about 20 years ago, I started preaching the two great commandments. Y'all hear it all the time. Y'all are... Y'all have grown accustomed to it. Loving God, living Jesus. Two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, whichever verse you're looking at. Love your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor as yourself is to live Jesus in the community around you. Okay? Those are the two great commandments. Jesus says this, all of the law and the prophets are found in these two commands. If we love God and act like it, we'll keep, keep the law. We'll honor God with our lives. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, we won't covet what they got. 
let alone murder them. Right? You see what I mean? Those are things, if we'll love it. Now, the title of the book I was going to write never wrote. Love God, love others, and act like it. Act like you love people. Man, we, can, we encounter folks every day that are so soured on life. Patricia's in the back back there, but that song you sang, these lyrics were on my podium before you ever sang it. It's not that song, but listen to this. It's a song entitled Breathe. Remember last week when I said I never in, in all my life had to tell my lungs to breathe? Nothing, nothing in my, no, no morning of the day, no morning of my life did I ever wake up and go, okay, now breathe. No, it just happens because God told this body that he created, he created. Right? He spoke it. He formed it. He breathed into it. I have life because God gave me life. And no, way, no time in my life have I ever said, okay, lungs, now breathe. Okay, diaphragm, pull down so the lungs open up so air goes in. I never did that. In all my life, I never had to tell myself to breathe. Listen to this. It's called Breathe by Maverick City. It says, this goes out to the worried. This goes out to the stressed. Sorting out a million thoughts running through your head. To everyone that's waiting for better days ahead. Tired and frustrated and leaving words unsaid. Please don't hold your breath. Just breathe. Because it's a miracle we can breathe. There's power in the way that we breathe. Release your heavy burdens and let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That is why we have breath. So praise the Lord. Sometimes you're in a desert. Sometimes you feel the pain. Sometimes he calms a storm. And sometimes he lets it rain. Please don't hold your breath. Just breathe. I've been listening to that song for a few weeks too. It showed up in one of my playlists. And that's the only time. And that's probably why I used that as an illustration last week that I'll just stop and go, okay. And in that, in that moment to simply say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. See, love God. <clears throat> Ask how you can love God better every day. I did have the opportunity last week to tell somebody many of the choices that we believe we make wouldn't be choices at all if we loved God first, most, and best. You know, God loved you first most and best love God back first most and best it all starts with Jesus and if you don't know Jesus you need Jesus if you need to know Jesus I want to tell you about he's not just mine he can be yours too but you see if you don't know Jesus you need Jesus pray with me okay God I thank you thank you so much for the for, just for your word, the way you've spoken, God, the way you communicate through through your creation and, and through the Bible, and God, the way you've communicated through Jesus, and, and God, the love that you've shown us. God, help us to love you back. God, help us to, to, to do the things, say the things, show the things that let others know about your love. God, help us to, God, help us to act like it. God, I thank you for every person in the room this morning. We've just begun the day. We get to do this all morning long. So God, help us to help us to worship you. Help us to love you best. God, if there's anybody here this morning needs Jesus, we want to introduce them. God, if there are Christians here this morning that are just living the burden, God, I just pray 
as we've sung and as we've heard this morning. God, help us to release the burden because you said cast your cares on me because you care for us. So God, help us to cast our cares on you. And God, if there's somebody that wants to be a part of this gathering and what you're doing here, God, I just pray. God, we just do whatever you tell us to do. God, help us to respond. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.